This is the day that has been given to us. Rather than creating it, earning it, or deserving it, we receive this day. And we receive it as a gift, a gift from the universe, a gift from God, a gift from life itself. As we gather today online and in person, let us receive the gift of this day and make of it a time to recommit to our highest ideals and our deepest commitments. In our freely covenanted faith of Unitarian Universalism, we know that it is the shared commitments of our covenant, not any creed or belief, that bind us together in beloved community and that inspire us to faithful service. So as we enter our time of worship, in my case for the last time with you today here at the Birmingham Unitarian Church, let's join together in giving voice to the promise of this congregation's covenant as part of the beloved BUC community. I promise to strive to be my best self in all my interactions, assume the best intentions of everyone's actions, be mindful of our shared humanity in our communications, pause, reflect, and be part of the solution when things go awry. Thus do we covenant with one another. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Birmingham Unitarian Church. It is so good to be together again. Whether you are joining us here in the sanctuary, remotely via Zoom, or watching this recording later, it is great to be connected. As a multi-platform church, it is important for us to build bridge between online and in-person uh, participants. We call this opportunity greeting our virtual neighbors. First, we will project the folks who are currently on Zoom up here on our screen and ask them to turn their cameras on and give us a wave. We're not gonna wave back because that's what you're gonna do next. 
<laughs> now, we're, um, we, now we zoom up here on the screen, blah, blah, blah. Now we are gathered here in person. We'll turn and face the black camera, not the clock, the camera, and give them a welcoming, hearty wave. Now, if you're visiting for the first time, welcome. We are glad you're here. If you are with us in the sanctuary, we invite you to join us for coffee and conversation in our social hall, which is just out the doors and to the left. Now, you may also want to join us, especially because this Sunday we're going to have a little celebration of Reverend Poe's this last Sunday with us. So a little cake is going to be on hand, and um, we are going to be there to wish him well with his new congregation. If you are with us on Zoom, we invite you to stay on for a virtual coffee hour immediately after service. Whenever and however we connect with BUC, we are building BUC. At home, on campus, in the world, every day we are Birmingham Unitarian Church and we are building the beloved community. We call forth the life of our faith by igniting the chalice. This spark of new beginnings invites us into a sacred space to reflect where we have been and where we are going. With our ritual extinguishing, we fear not its end, for we know with brave hearts that from every ending of our lives, we are sent forth to make a new beginning. Now, would you please rise and join in singing hymn number 108, My Life Flows On. Our 
Our story for today comes from the wonderful Eric Carl, and it is A House for Hermit Crab. Time to move, said Hermit Crab one day in January. I've grown too big for this shell. They had felt snug and safe in their shell, but now it was too snug. Hermit Crab stepped out of the shell and onto the floor of the ocean. But it was frightening out in the ocean without a shell to hide in. What if a big fish comes along and attacks me, they thought. I must find a new house soon. In early February, Hermit Crab found just the house he was looking for. It was a big shell and strong. They moved right in, wriggling and waggling about inside it just to see how it felt. And it felt just right. But it looks so, well, plain, thought Hermit Crab. In March, Hermit Crab met some sea anemones. They swayed gently back and forth in the water. How beautiful you are, said Hermit Crab. Would one of you be willing to come and live on my house? It's so plain, it needs you. I'll come, whispered a small sea anemone. Gently, Hermit Crab picked it up with their claw and put it on their shell. In April, Hermit Crab passed a flock of starfish moving slowly along the sea floor. How handsome you are, said Hermit Crab. Would one of you be willing to decorate my house? I would, singled, signaled the little sea star. Carefully, Hermit Crab picked it up with their claw and put it on their house. In May, Hermit Crab discovered some coral. They were hard and didn't move. How pretty you are, said Hermit Crab. Would one of you be willing to help make my house more beautiful? I would, creaked a crusty coral. Gingerly, Hermit Crab picked it up with their claw and placed it on their shell. In June, Hermit Crab came to a group of snails crawling over a rock on the ocean floor. They grazed as they went, picking up allergy, or allergies are on my mind. <laughs> algae <laughs> and bits of debris and leaving a neat path behind them. How tidy and hard working you are, said Hermit Crab. Would one of you be willing to come and help clean my house? I would, <laughs> offered one of the snails. Happily, Hermit Crab picked it up with their claw and placed it on their house. In July, Hermit Crab came upon several sea urchins. They had sharp, prickly needles. How fierce you look, said Hermit Crab. Would one of you be willing to protect my house? I would, answered the spiky sea urchin. Gratefully, Hermit Crab picked it up with their claw and placed it near their house. In August, Hermit Crab and his friends wandered into a forest of seaweed. It's so dark here, thought Hermit Crab. How dim it is, murmured the sea anemone. How gloomy it is, whispered the starfish. How murky it is, complained the coral. I can't see, said the snail. It's like a nightmare, <laughs> cried the sea urchin. In September, Hermit Crab spotted a school of lanternfish darting through the dark water. How bright you are, said Hermit Crab. Would one of you be willing to light up our house? I would, replied one lanternfish, and it swam over near the shell. In October, Hermit Crab approached a pile of smooth pebbles. How sturdy you are, said Hermit Crab. Would you mind if I rearranged you? Not at all, whispered the pebbles. Hermit crab picked them up one by one with their claw and built a, a wall around their shell. 
Now our house is perfect, cheered Hermit Crab. But in November, Hermit Crab felt that the shell seemed a bit too small. Little by little, over the year, Hermit Crab had grown. Soon, they would have to find another, bigger home. But he had come to love his friends, the sea anemone, the starfish, the coral, the sea urchin, the snail, the lanternfish, and even the smooth pebbles. They've been so good to me, thought Hermit Crab. They're like a family. How can I ever leave them? In December, a smaller hermit crab passed by. I've outgrown my shell, she said. Would you know of a place for me? I've outgrown my house too, answered hermit crab. I must move on, but you're welcome to live here. You just have to promise to be good to my friends. I promise, said the little crab. The following January, Hermit Crab stepped out and the little crab moved in. Couldn't stay in that little shell forever, said Hermit Crab as he waved goodbye. The, the ocean floor looked wider than they had remembered, but Hermit Crab wasn't afraid. Soon they spied the perfect house, a big empty shell. It looked well, a little plain, but sponges, they thought, barnacles, clownfish, sand dollars, electric eels. Oh, there are so many possibilities. I can't wait to get started. The mission of Birmingham Unitarian Church is to be a free and welcoming religious community that encourages lives of integrity, learning, service, and joy. One way we live out this mission is by giving half of our weekly offering to a nonprofit organization that shares our values and addresses needs in one of these areas. Environmental action, economic justice, civic engagement, and racial justice. We support a new organization each month. This month's plate recipient is Samaritas of Southeast Michigan Refugee and Resettlement Replacement Program. Our contribution will aid in the resettlement of more than 850 adults and children this year who are fleeing the ravages of war, persecution, and violence. Our contribution lets us be part of their stories of beginning again, welcoming them as we hope others would welcome us. Samaritas of Southeast Michigan has sent a short video to tell us more. My name is Anita, Anita Savanovich. I, I am, am a vice president at Ecobank. 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 I am, I am also, also a refugee, refugee from Bosnia Herzegovina at the age of 12, 12 13. 13. You really you don't really understand, don't understand, understand all, the all the details of what the war brings. brings. So, so you're, looking you're looking at, at it through, through eyes of a child. child. One, One day, day the, the place where I lived, where I lived was, was basically, basically occupied, occupied by the occupying army and we were the civilians sitting at home. My mother, my mother pulled out, pulled out my, my earrings, earrings and, and I had a little watch that my father, that my father bought, me bought me and, and had to take, had to take that, that off as, as the occupying army. They, they could cut off cut your off ear and, 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 and do, uh, do crazy uh, things that don't happen, happen anymore. anymore. That was the that was day, day that my that father, father was taken, was taken into a concentration, concentration camp. camp. And as you and can as imagine, you know, certainly my childhood was stolen from me as I had to grow up really quickly. How do you recover? In order, In order to come, to come into the United, United States, States, you have to have, have a sponsor, have a sponsor here. here. My, my, my mom, mom had, a had a sister who lived here. here. She's, She's the one who sponsored, who sponsored us. us. And, and that had, that to, had be to be completed through, through an agency. An agency. Samaritans, Samaritans ended, ended up providing, up providing the, housing. the housing, also, also provided, provided the, the very, very crucial, crucial needs, needs that, that refugees, refugees have. have. 
as, as helpless, helpless as, as a refugee, refugee feels, feels at the time, at the time when they come in. They're really they're everything, everything to them. them. Samaritans, Samaritans to a refugee, to a refugee just, coming just coming to this country, to this country means, means really, really everything. everything. And now will the ushers please come forward? We are a church of open minds, loving hearts, and helping hands. With gratitude, we dedicate this offering to the good works of our congregation and dedicate ourselves to its service. We engage in many kinds of spiritual practices in our congregations, some of them individually and some of them collectively. That includes a sharing of joys and sorrows. And before I begin with a couple of more traditional ones, uh, as this is my last Sunday, which I'll say more about that in a minute, but it's also somebody else's, I'm sorry to say, last Sunday in a staff role here at BUC so I want to take this opportunity to express immense gratitude for the, for the time of service in uh, coordinating our audiovisual uh, work on Sunday morning, microphones, uh, preparing things beforehand, running Zoom meetings, setting up Zoom meetings at other times, and so much else. Much thanks to David Urich. And 
I'll also lift up in particular, there is so much that I'm grateful for and not enough time to express it all, but I do want to especially lift up gratitude for the other members of the staff that I've gotten to work with over these last five months. Uh, to Sarah Constantakis as our Director of Congregational Life, to Shannon Snydman, our Religious Educator, to Valerie Phillips, our Administrator, as well as uh, Taylor Phillips, who's uh, been AV Tech and will be taking on some of David's tasks. We're also looking for volunteers for other tasks, so keep, keep your eyes on your email. But, and for Colin Phillips working in the with the coffee hour, our young people who help in the nursery, uh, for our maintenance staff and so many others. It has been a great team to work with. I've been honored to be part of it. <laughs> and we do have a couple of other uh, joys and sorrows. Uh, both somewhat mixed, actually, but I'll start with Sarah Redman expressing thanks that her son uh, is continuing to recover from emergency open heart surgery. We're glad that his recovery is proceeding well. And from Larry Friedman, who shares that his daughter Emily has been diagnosed with uterine cancer, and that will require surgery uh, the, the silver lining is that it appears the cancer has not spread, he notes, though they are uh, studying tests uh, currently to be certain of that. He does ask that we keep her, that we keep Emily in our thoughts. And for all of these sorrows, all of these joys of our lives, those we express and those that we've not yet shared, may we be present with one another in our beloved community of care and support. Now, we have uh, often also shared an embodied uh, spiritual practice. The reason I'm skipping that for today is I want to make a particular note uh, about the uh, words of meditation and prayer that I'm about to share. They are often quoted, but I learned something new about them that y'all might know better than I do. The words I'm about to share have been widely quoted over the last several decades and frequently attributed inaccurately as it happens uh, to the great liberation theology leader from uh, Central America, the Archbishop Oscar Romero. It actually happens that their author was uh, one of the leaders of the liberal wing of Roman Catholicism in the United States during the 60s, 70s, and 80s. But I didn't know that particular piece about him until I was researching this reading yesterday, nor did I realize until yesterday that some of y'all might know him because he, or at least know the name, because he had actually been for much of that time the Archbishop of Detroit. I'm speaking of John Dearden. So, with just slight adaptations for our theology, I share these prayerful words from John Dearden, and I invite you, as I do so, to find yourself reaching deep within, reaching far beyond yourself to connect with what you know as sacred. Spirit of life and love, God known in so many ways and mystery beyond our naming. We know that, as John Dearden reminds us, it helps now and then to step back and take a long view. We accomplish in our lifetime only a tiny fraction of that magnificent enterprise that is God's work. Nothing we do is complete, no statement says all that could be said. No prayer fully expresses our faith. No confession brings perfection. No pastoral visit brings wholeness. No program accomplishes the church's mission. No set of goals and objectives includes everything. This is what we are about. 
We plant the seeds that one day will grow. We water seeds already planted, knowing that they hold future promise. We lay foundations that will need further development. We provide yeast that produces far beyond our capabilities. We cannot do everything. And there is a sense of liberation in realizing that this enables us to do something and to do it very well. It may be incomplete, but it is a beginning, a step along the way, an opportunity for grace to enter and do the rest. We may never see the end results, but that is the difference between the master builder and the worker. We are workers, not master builders. We are ministers, not messiahs. And we are prophets of a future, not our own. Blessed may we all be. Amen. Please join me now in a moment of silence. The longer I live, the more more I realize the impact of attitude on life. Attitude to me is more important than facts. It is more important than the past, than education, the money, the circumstances, the failures, than successes, than what other people think or say or do. It is more important than appearance, giftedness, or skill. It will make or break a company, a church, a home. The remarkable thing is we have a choice every day regarding the attitude we will embrace for that day. We cannot change our past. 
We cannot change the fact that people will act in a certain way. We cannot change the inevitable. The only thing we can do is play on the one string we have, and that is our attitude. I am convinced, convinced that life is 10% what happens to me and 90% of how I react to it. And so it is with you. We are in charge of our attitudes. Teresa, and uh, thank you to John and to Don for the wonderful music. And apologies for forgetting to tell you that we generally sing Return Again twice. That's on me. <laughs> and I'm sorry to do this, but as a person who occasionally forgets details, and as this is my last Sunday, I fear if I don't do it now, I won't remember. Our second reading today actually comes from the current president of our National Unitarian Universalist Association, the Reverend Dr. Sophia Betancourt. Uh, this is a very recent reading. It's actually an excerpt uh, from a sermon she delivered just last month at one of our congregations in Pennsylvania, the UU Church of the Susquehanna Valley. The love that lives at the center of this faith is very simply the love that will not let us go. No matter how cranky we are, how ornery on that day, how full of grief, or full of ourselves, or full of joy, it's a love that expects nothing less of us than the rebuilding of a struggling world. Sometimes what we know of love and justice pushes us in ways we never expected. And sometimes the need to bear such a love into the world is heartbreakingly large. It's in those moments that we most need one another and most need beloved community. We need reminding and solidarity. We need connection and care. We also, in our freely made choice to participate in this greater community, know that it can slowly renew us. It can even repair the kinds of grief that have been building for so many of us to restore what we long to hold at our own centers and to heal that which keeps us from being more loving. And so we side with love. We organize in the name of love. We educate about the importance of love. We donate to further love. And most of all, we share that love together.
One of the things I've seen over and over for years in several churches that I've served as a transitional minister is that these times of transitions in churches are rich opportunities for thinking in new ways about who we are and where we are. And recognizing those changes can be sad, can leave us with a sense of loss for what's no longer the same, but it also leaves us room to grow into something new. And yes, I am talking in part about BUC, but let me first illustrate this offer as best I can, unpack the point with the story of my own transition, just a bit of context about myself over these last few months, and particularly this aspect. Well, as several of you know, and I have over my career had a tendency to mention ad nauseum, I'm a native of the state of Texas. And I don't think I've uh, offered this quote here. Apologies if you have heard me say it before, but in the words of the great Texas uh, political commentator and satirist uh, Molly Ivins, I dearly love the state of Texas, but I consider that a harmless perversion among, among others and discuss it only among consenting adults. <laughs> <laughs> and as some of you know, I came here from Texas and in fact from my hometown, the Denton, the college town north of Dallas and Fort Worth, where I had gone back home a year and a half earlier to serve as minister at my old home church. Now, it, it was only financial reasons that it didn't work out. But as it happened, after over a decade of living in different states and serving as interim minister and telling people that I was an expat or expatriate Texan, you know, the the kind who's temporarily away from home, but I'll be going back someday, right? I went back home and found that home had changed. Texas had changed. And frankly, after way too long of me trying to tell uh, liberals and progressives in other parts of the country that while some of the stereotypes about Texas are true, a lot of it's not nearly as bad as you think it is. A lot of it's much better than you think it is. That's still somewhat true but not nearly as much as it used to be. Place just got meaner while I was gone. And in fairness, I changed too. 11 years and living in six different states in various parts of the country, of course, are gonna do that to a person. It wasn't the fit of home that I expected. And as I said uh, just a couple of months ago when I visited the church that I will be serving soon, the UU Church of Cherry Hill in southern New Jersey, the Philadelphia suburbs, I no longer call myself an expat Texan. I'm now a former Texan. You hear the difference? Yeah. But here's my point. I came to think of home in a new way over this time. And yeah, the way it happened was somewhat painful. But it not only helped me to rethink about home, it helped me rethink about myself and see a little more clearly some of the ways that I had changed. And those are likely to serve me well as I make my new home, hopefully more long-term, at the Church of New Jersey. And I offer that as an illustration for you, BUC, because you're also embarking on a reconsideration of what your collective religious home will be. And I'm talking about that on several levels, more than you might expect. Yes, many of the changes you're facing are gonna be local, are gonna be specific to Birmingham Unitarian Church. The most obvious being the ministry transition after Reverend Mandy Beale's departure in October, and a few months without a minister, and then myself here very short term, as targeted minister, and yes, there should have been a different name. <laughs> After this, you'll be going just four weeks without a minister. Not, not four months, just four weeks. And then I'm pleased that I can now share, as was announced uh, online earlier this week, that Reverend Connie Grant will be your interim minister starting in August. 
uh, she'll actually officially start August 1st, and I believe mid-August she'll will be her first Sunday in the pulpit. But of course, there's also questions about where we dwell as a church, about this building and its long-term maintenance needs, and whether a congregation that is not as large as it once were, and that's true for the majority of congregations in the country, whether this is still the best dwelling place for you or whether a different one might be a better dwelling place. And I say that very open-endedly. I can honestly see it working out either way. It's gonna be a question to be exploring as well as you think about other aspects of your financial life and uh, how that impacts so many other aspects of being and doing church. But of course, in addition to the local changes, there are national ones. Um, many of you know that there has been an ongoing discussion over the last couple of years at the national level about uh, changes to uh, what's generally known as Article 2 by shorthand. That means the, uh, that's the section of the Unitarian Universal Association bylaws, uh, which included the seven principles, and this congregation, like many others, had since added an eighth principle, as well as the sources, the six sources, of our living tradition. Well, for those who did not hear, uh, General Assembly, the National Convention of Unitarian Universalists was this past weekend, it was all online. And the changes to Article 2, with just one very small amendment, tweaking the language in one small section of it, uh, passed actually overwhelmingly, uh, more than 80% voting yes. It was, a bit of a surprise that it was that overwhelming. I must say, even to me, I kind of if I, I kind of suspected it might pass, but I did not expect such a wide margin. And well, let me say two things about that. Um, first of all, I want to introduce you to a term that you're likely to start hearing, and it may surprise you. But now that. Now that Article 2 of the UUA bylaws contains not a list of principles, but a list of values and covenantal promises associated with each value, there have been, uh, there's been a conversation growing amongst ministers and religious educators about uh, how to uh, teach people, and particularly our young people, about those values. And someone, I don't remember if it was a minister or a religious educator, uh, discovered some time ago that if you list the values in a certain order, it creates an acronym, a mnemonic, that can be helpful for young people in learning these values. Taylor, will you put the first slide on the screen? Yeah, so, so the values, justice, equity, some of you are seeing it already, justice, equity, transformation, pluralism, interdependence, and generosity, and yes, we also understand love at the center of that. But for these other six, go ahead and put the second slide up. Jet pig. A couple of notes about this. First of all, that, that plush animal you see, uh, it's actually a character from a children's book, but they've created a plush toy about it. W one of the religious educators stumbled across that on Amazon, and sales have gone up since that happened. <laughs> as uh, countless ministers and religious educators have bought that thing as a visual tool to start teaching young people about these values and help them remember what they are. Um, and I do want to stress, this was nothing that was intentionally created in the statement. This was nothing that the Article II task force that originally articulated this language came up with. It was just something that somebody else noticed about it later, okay? And I know that there are people who find it um, well, childish, um, as if that was a negative thing. Personally, I must say, I find it rather whimsical. And I think our religious life, our collective religious life could do with a bit of whimsy. But more relevantly, I do know that Article 2 was controversial and that a majority of this congregation voted against it when there was a vote taken a little over a year ago. And I was wondering what to say to you about that, but I found something incredibly well articulated by a colleague that with his permission, I'll share with you a somewhat extended 
passage here. This comes from uh, the, the regional lead staff person for the Mid-America region of the UUA, the Reverend David Pyle, who I've referred to before and who has a relationship with this congregation. But he wrote, I feel deep empathy and compassion for those who may be feeling as if Unitarian Universalism is moving beyond them with the vote yesterday at the UUA General Assembly to adopt the new formulation for Article 2 and the transition from the principles and sources to the values. Now that the vote is complete, I feel I can share a few things that I have felt I could not as a member of the UUA staff. He goes on to say, the principles and sources are very important to me. The radical nature of the UU principles, particularly the first and the seventh principle, the ideas of inherent worth and dignity of every person and the interdependent web of all existence of which we're a part, that was at the center of my healing from what I had borne witness to in the aftermath of coming home from the war in Bosnia in 1997. I would likely not be a UU were it not for my own encounter with the principles. And the principles and sources remain just as important to me today as they have the 25 plus years I've been part of this religious faith community. And then he goes on to add, now I have something new to engage with, to allow my personal faith and beliefs to flow around and through. And I can see myself and the community I want to be a part of reflected in those values. Are they a perfect reflection of my faith? No, nothing ever is. And if they were, then I would have no growing to do. And without growing, what's the point of religious community? So, he concludes, if the principles and sources remain sacred and important to you, then keep them so. But they are just as much a reflection of who we are today as they were yesterday and a new formulation of the purpose of the UUA only adds to who we are. It does not take anything away unless you let it. So concludes his words. And I'll add by noting that here at BUC, you've clearly stated something similar. Your board has already voted that this congregation will continue to affirm the eight principles uh, while exploring the values and the covenant. Here's my point. Something about the articulation of our home faith, of your home faith tradition has changed. Though, forgive me for adding, it has not changed nearly as much as Texas has. <laughs> but here's my invitation to you. Take some time to explore those values. Take some time to try them on, to start to feel how they might be meaningful for you. Maybe they won't. But failing to give them a chance predetermines your view. So as we think about those kinds of changes happening around us, there's also a couple of more specific things relevant to say, especially about the ministerial change. As I'm preparing to depart from you, I'm reminded of some advice from someone else about ministerial departures. Uh, this wisdom comes from a book, it's about 20 years old, 10 Commandments for Pastors Leaving a Congregation. Uh, this was actually written by a, a Presbyterian minister, Lawrence Ferris. And while not all of his advice is relevant for us, I want to share four of his points. And the first one I think may be key. Thou shalt grieve. And honestly, that's what I'm doing. I have, in the short time I've been here, come to find very good things about this state that I had not set foot in until I moved here in late January. And I'm still doing a little bit of grieving, as you could likely hear, about my former home state. But we sometimes forget or willfully ignore the need to grieve these changes, and grieving well in a way that processes our feelings about loss, includes recalling the memories of what we're losing. 
then we can genuinely experience the emotions that, are right, that arise around those memories of who or what we're losing and can process them and can live into them in a more healthy way. For here at BUC, I suspect that you may still have some grieving to do over the leave taking of Reverend Mandy Beale some months ago. Those of you who valued her ministry and grieve her absence, as well as those of you who struggled with her ministry and grieve the absence of a different style of minister during those years. Each of those has its own integrity. And if I have been of any help to you in taking the first steps through that grief, I'm glad I invite you to be intentional about the next steps. But a couple of other points. Uh, Reverend Ferris does say, thou shalt usually, in parentheses, stay away once thou hast left. And I think that's generally good advice, especially for transitional ministers. Of course, in our particular situation, it applies simply by virtue of the fact that not long from now, I'm going to be living over 600 miles from here. We won't have opportunity often to see each other. But also, and I think this is true in a more general way for you, in a more specific way for me, thou shalt attend to thy family. Thinking through the various options for the future while preparing for the move is something that uh, my spouse Susie and I have certainly done. And in fact, the reason she's not here with me this morning is she had some packing that she wanted to get ahead on. And we're not going to have much time. We actually leave on Wednesday morning. But it's also given us an opportunity to um, spend some quality time together as we've explored this state, including a great trip up north last weekend. I can now honestly say that I have seen all five of the Great Lakes. And finally, oh, well, let me add, for BUC, I think what this may more relevantly mean is giving yourselves the grace to be open to what's next. And that leads me into the final point. Thou shalt affirm thy congregation's ministry. Because what is next for this congregation is not completely certain. We know the next step, and I look forward to Reverend Grant's joining you soon. I do believe, I truly believe it will be good, even though it will feel awkward on some days. It will nonetheless ultimately be good to take some time throughout this period of transition, these next two years of interim work that you'll be doing alongside Reverend Connie to think through longer-term goals and reflect a little more deeply on how your identity as a church will both hold steady in some ways and change in others. Because, of course, it will do some of each. My role now is to step back so that your interim minister and your lay leaders, with input from all of you, have time and space to discern the direction for the future. But whatever choices you might make, Please know that wherever I am, I will keep quietly cheering on your successes from a distance and celebrating every good thing that will, sooner or later, be coming your way. So fare thee well, BUC. So may it be for us all.
so as we go forth from this sacred time, go forth from the many sacred places where we have gathered. May we go knowing ourselves to be graced with the blessings of, of gratitude for the nurturing of our spirits and community, of humility when we fall short of our highest aspirations, and of resilience to strengthen our resolve. With this, let us go forth from this place and this time of ministry together and continue finding new ways to serve this hurting world in the spirit of love. Go in peace.